Welcome back to three months of modal logic, a sequel to the 100 days of logic, kind of a logic 201 here with Carnades.org. In this video, we're going to be doing our solution to our deontic trifold challenge or the deontic non-contradiction challenge. If you haven't checked out the challenge, pop back two videos to video 111. The deontic non-contradiction challenge is what you can search for. It has a cool challenge for you to try if you have a good basis in propositional calculus and a basic understanding of some of the concepts of deontic logic we've presented so far. If you feel comfortable with those things, this is a really good way to test your ability to do proofs, and specifically test your ability to do proofs in deontic logic. If you're comfortable with that, you want to check your own solution, or you just want to see what my solution is because you've given up, follow me and let's get started. So, here is the conclusion that we're trying to prove, that the deontic non-contradiction axiom is equivalent to the logical description of the deontic trifold. <clears throat> now, we're going to go through a very similar process to the last solution to the deontic square solution. And also in this video, because all of these premises are going to be really, really long and a lot of moving pieces going on. I'm not going to read through step by step every single premise. Hopefully you can pause the video and get a sense for what I'm doing at each step. And I'm going to kind of give you the broad strokes in what I'm explaining. But I don't think it's too helpful for me to go through every single piece. There may be some mistakes in here. I've looked it over as best I can, but there's always going to be a missing closed parenthesis or an extra negation thrown in somewhere. If you find any mistakes, please note them in the comments below. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do with this equivalence is we want to prove a conditional both ways. Equivalence just means a biconditional, biconditional being two conditionals, conditional in both directions. So we're going to as we did with the last one, start with the longer piece of the premise first and do an assumed conditional proof. So that's just the logical description of the deontic trifold in an assumed conditional proof. We'll draw our line going down. As you can tell, it's going to be a short assumed conditional proof. Now, premise two is actually going to be pretty important because it's the redescription. It's the translation of what we have for our deontic trifold logical description translated into just obligation. So we remembered that all four of our other deontic predicates in deontic logic can be expressed in terms of just obligation. So what we've done here is we've done that. We've expressed optionality and impermissibility in terms of obligation. You note it gets a little bit longer because optionality has a really long substantial definition. But the point here is that we've expanded this out and we've gotten it only in terms of obligation. Our conclusion that we're looking for is only in terms of obligation, so we only want this in terms of obligation. The good news for this direction of the proof is that we have our conclusion included as one of the conjuncts. You can look through it and find it if you want, but all we're going to say is you can simplify premise two down to very easily. It's not the case, it's obligatory that P, and it's obligatory that not P. That was our goal, so we can go ahead and do premise 1 through 3, conditional proof, and say that all of this long thing, the logical description of the deontic trifold, implies the deontic non-contradiction axiom. That was easy. Going the other way is going to be a little bit harder because we're going to be going and kind of having to build up our premise. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another assumed conditional proof. This is going to, once again, take our deontic non-contradiction axiom, the other side of our equivalence, and we're going to try to prove things the other way. We're going to try to prove up to basically premise two and then use our deontic definition to translate back into premise one. So we're going to, first off, take from premise five and do an addition and a commutativity. We can also get this way from the law of the excluded middle, but we can also take it from addition and commutativity from premise five, basically taking the negation of the premise and disjoining it with the original premise. Then we're going to use de Morgan's law so that we can get a conjunction in there at the end. Remember, what we're shooting for is to get a bunch of conjunctions that are negated at the end and one long disjunction at the beginning. Then we're going to go ahead and distribute this disjunction between these two conjuncts. So we have kind of a long disjunction and another long disjunction that are both conjoined. Keeping that premise, we're going to 
keep moving. We're going to do De Morgan's Law not once, but twice in two premises to get rid of all of those disjunctions that we can and change them all to conjunctions. So this is just going to be one long conjunction. Remember, that's what we're shooting for at the end of our final premise. We're shooting for a disjunction between obligation, optionality, and impermissibility, and then a set of negated conjunctions between obligation and impermissibility, obligation and optionality, and optionality and implication. So we want a bunch of negated conjunctions at the end, which is kind of what we're looking at right now. When we conjoin that with premise five, we're going to get even more negated conjunctions. Once again, this is what we're looking for here. And then when we conjoin it with premise seven, we're going to get kind of this disjunction at the beginning, followed by a bunch of negated conjunctions. This should start looking very similar to premise two, which is what we're shooting for. And finally, what we're going to do is we need to get everything in the right order. So we're going to use some commutativity and some associativity to move all of our pieces around so we have these in the same order that we saw them in premise two and in the same order that they were in our specific description. Note this step is a little extraneous depending on what you're doing with logic. You don't always need to have them in perfectly the exact order, but sometimes it helps because sometimes there might be a rule that you can't perfectly switch things when you think you can and you might make a mistake in a step. So this should look basically like our premise two. We'll restate that premise one more time and then we'll kind of go backwards a step and use our deontic definitions to get just our logical description of the deontic trifold here in premise 14. Now, because we've gotten from our deontic non-contradiction axiom all the way to the logical description of our deontic trifold, we can say premise 5 through 14, conditional proof, and just have that basic implication going the opposite way of the earlier premise that we had. Then we're going to go further a step and conjoin these two premises, premise 4 and premise 15. That's the implication going one way and the implication going the other way. We're putting them in square brackets because both the premises are pretty long, and if we listed the whole thing, it would be a little confusing. And then finally, we're going to use equivalence to take the conjunction of two implications and turn it into an equivalent statement or a biconditional. That's our conclusion, so we're done. And that's the proof. If you find any mistakes in here, please offer them in the comments below. I'm pretty sure the proof is valid, but there might be a parenthesis or a negation missing somewhere. And if in your own proof you're missing something like that, it's not something to worry about. The key is as long as you've done the steps correctly and you've used the rules correctly. If you use the rules incorrectly and therefore make a mistake, you have a much bigger problem. And if you prove something that you shouldn't be able to prove, that's a bigger problem. But if you're just missing a closed parenthesis, but you understand that it's there, everyone who would be reading the proof would understand it's there, it's not as much to worry about. But if you've made it through these last two proofs, props to you, they're two pretty difficult proofs, there's a lot of places you can get lost, so great job. In the next couple videos, we're going to be kind of continuing with our not as rigorous proof-obsessed parts of this. We're going to be talking more about some of the axioms of deontic logic and standard deontic logic and eventually the semantics. So up next, we're going to talk about types of deontic contradictions. We're going to talk specifically about the difference between the omissibility of contradictions axiom and the deontic non-contradiction axiom. Watch. This video and more here at Carnades.org and a new video on modal logics every single day for the next three months. Stay skeptical, everybody.